Let's start with our panelists talking briefly about um, the variety of growing career pathways related to their business and what they do, particularly focusing on entry level opportunities and what those skills and experiences are that are really important and, and how to prepare. I think that's kind of the crux of what a lot of people that are here want to know about. So I know it's a lot of mouthful. Um, uh, we're going to keep this to about three to four minutes each, if you don't mind. And hopefully we have the timer to help you out. Um, but if not, then I will um, kind of keep an eye on it as well. Okay. So this time, let's start um, with uh, Latiara Haynes. If you would start, please. Okay, I was waiting for the last one. There we go. Muted. Um, yes, well, as a teacher myself, I would love to know since I've been out of the industry for a bit. But for a position like mine, um, to be specifically a CTE teacher, which is a bit different than um, being a, a single subject science teacher, you do have to have um, industry experience. Um, that can help students build the skills that they would need to go into either an entry level position um, that doesn't require a bachelor's, maybe just an associate's degree, or if you would like to go on uh, more to the doctorate um, field. But yeah, for a CTE position, you, you take a, a couple of classes, um, but you um, really do have to have the industry experience and um, show those hours and um, get that signed off. And usually the getting the credential is really easy, but then you actually have to spend a lot of time of building um, your own classroom and lab and curriculum and such. But that's it really for me, but I'm really curious to hear from everyone else. I can tell my own student. <laughs> Great. Um, and let's go to Quinn, a little bit about the career pathways. I mean, you're a huge organization, but locally, some of the career pathways, the entry level and how people can move from there. Yeah, I think we have a little bit of a unique instance here. So for those that don't know, um, Kite is one of the pioneers in cell therapy, particularly for oncology, uh, with two commercial CAR-T therapies on the market. Um, for different indications of blood cancers. Um, I am very fortunate to be able to say that I had joined Kite pretty early on when we were a small startup company um, and stayed on when we were acquired ultimately by Gilead Sciences and of course commercialized. So I've seen a lot of evolution within the organization. Um, here, specifically in Los Angeles, a lot of the work that we're doing is helping to build that healthy ecosystem and bridge a lot of those health inequities. Um, but our career paths are pretty broad um, because out of our Santa Monica headquarters, that includes a lot of corporate functions, IT, HR, corporate development, business development. Um, we have a state-of-the-art R&D campus that includes early to late stage research, process development, and clinical manufacturing. And then El Segundo, our commercial manufacturing plant, um, is all-encompassing site-specific with manufacturing opportunities, but that also includes quality, supply chain. So it's, um, for me, actually, my personal experience, it wasn't until I got into industry myself that I started to realize there are a lot of different career paths that you can leverage your biotech background or your biotech um, passion um, in multi-facets across the industry. Okay. And what would you say are some of the more entry level positions? So um, we have cell therapy technicians, distribution technicians. Um, that's at our plant. Um, within our uh, R&D facility or RDMC facility, there's um, entry level research positions, um, project coordinators, where ultimately that career path would lead somebody towards project management or even portfolio strategy. So when you look across the, if I can contextualize it, just across the, we have 4,200 employees currently at Kite, um, and that's probably encompassing about 300 job profiles. Hey, yeah, that's, that's a lot. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sean, with your unique entrepreneurial background, what would you say are the uh, growing career pathways related to you know to you and your industry and entrepreneurship um what might be you know what is considered entry level is there such a thing and, and the skills that would be needed to get there 
Uh, that's a great question, and maybe you can also uh, hop in here, but afterwards. But uh, you know, entrepreneurship is basically creating your own job. So, um, uh, there, depending on what sort of company you're trying to start, uh, then may require some schooling. It may not. Um, in my case, you'll see I have um, way too much school. I I, I trained up until grade thirty one. Um, <laughs> So I did an MD, PhD, and then I did two postdocs um, that were three years each. Um, uh, all with the, so you know, it's helpful to know my background. I, I was actually uh, originally trained to become an, an academic neurosurgeon, um, and uh, I first arrived here in LA in 2010, where I was a resident at Cedar Sinai in neurosurgery uh, before I left to start my company. And so, so we could talk about that, although that's beyond the scope of this talk, the, the whole professional um, side of things um, as far as medicine. Um, but that, uh, basically allowed me to do what I did subsequently, which is start a biotech company, invent a new cancer drug, um, and then build a team around that, raise some money and get that into clinical trial, um, where we are now. Um, the other part of my job is helping other founders do the same thing. That's what a venture capitalist does. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a baby venture capitalist is my first fund. It's a fairly small, and we're looking for people like me 10 years ago who are just have an idea and, and the expertise and they're just uh, starting to think about launching a company and we want to be the first check in. So um, as far as, so there, that, that's, a, that's a whole nother world. Uh, that's very complicated. Some good resources for looking to venture capital are Twitter. <laughs> a lot, most of the VCs are tweeting at, at, at each other um, on, on Twitter and some of the very, uh, some of the more outspoken ones have been very successful in building sort of a brand. Um, and just by being a brand on Twitter, people have given them money. And so you can even, even people in college um, and younger are starting funds so, so far, the, the so-called Gen Z um, venture capitalists. And so that is possible. Um, it's, it's not easy and there's no prescribed path, but um, if you're good at media and social media, then, then that might be a good route. Um, as far as startups, again, startups, people, people think of Facebook, people think of TikTok and things like that. Uh, but really a startup is a 10 year journey, right? People think of, a, of, you know, you do a startup two years later, you sell for a billion dollars. Well, I've been working on mine since 2010 and the ideas were, were seeded a couple of years before that. Um, and we're still um, slogging away and still raising money. So you in order to survive, that difficult road, you really have to love what you're doing. Um, in my case, I, I, I'm trying to cure brain cancer. And um, and so that's pushed me through. So if you are going to start a company, that's the first thing. Love what you're doing and um, have the mission and, and work with great people. And, um, I, and most of that stuff can be found on the internet. <laughs> and I have a question for you, and maybe Pablo will, will also want to pipe in on this. Um, does does an entrepreneur need to have been in an industry sector, like let's say at Kite or in education um, as Latira, is that necessary? Or what, what would you say are the minimum qualifications to start a biotech related, life science related um, business? Oh, that's a great question. And there's, there's no correct answer, right? Because um, uh, I've seen people do it straight out of undergrad with no PhD. Um, then there's me who is the opposite of, of the famous dropouts. You know, they, they dropped out in undergrad. I didn't drop out until grade 31, as I mentioned. So um, they're much smarter than I was. Um, but uh, so, yeah, there's, there's no prescribed path. Um, but again, it comes down to the idea, your passion for it. You really want to see this exist in the world and just working um, uh, tirelessly to make that um, happen despite all the bad things that are going to happen because entrepreneurship is very difficult. Um, and so you, that's why you need the passion. Otherwise um, you probably will quit early on. Okay. Definitely Thank you. Done. Just yeah. to jump off. Just Pablo, to jump please. In. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's your turn anyway. So if, go if, right ahead. If Sean's on one end of the education spectrum, I'm, I'm closer to, to the other end. You know, I've got a bachelor's in a totally unrelated field. And, and the reason that's important to mention is because, you know, um, if you're thinking about starting a company, if, if you're thinking about getting involved in, in biotech and the life sciences, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to be educated in that field. I would say if you're starting something, maybe you'll want a technical co-founder that can go on this journey with you. But I think at the end of the day, 
um, you know, hard work, grit and determination tends to beat out education, tends to beat out everything else, right? And to Sean's point, you know, having that passion, the reason why that's important, um, whether you're passionate about what you're going to jump into or figuring out how you can be passionate about what you're doing is important because, you know, effectively it's, it's a bottomless fuel source, right? If you like what you do, you're going to show up every day. You're going to work harder. You know, you're going to, you're going to put that effort in, you're going to put in the, you know, the blood, sweat and tears. And, and that tends to beat out anything else showing up every single day, showing up for the work and, and doing your best tends to, tends to get you the, the results that you're looking for ultimately above all else. So now let's go to Omit um, and, and your experience in this alt, um, cultivated meat industry, alternative food. And what yeah. would you say are the growing parts of the business? Is it growing? Um, and, and where does an entry level person come into the picture? Yeah, so if you think of like alternative proteins as a broader industry, a subset of that is cultivated meat. And for those of you that don't know what cultivated meat is, cultured meat, maybe you've heard of it referred to as lab grown meat. I don't love that branding. We, we don't like to call it lab grown meat. But effectively what we're doing is, is we're creating meat, real animal meat, uh, without having to slaughter an animal. Uh, that's that's what we're doing. That's that's what we're aiming for. So so the goal here is to eliminate the animal slaughter, but it's also you know a, you know a more energy efficient way of of creating products that we all love to enjoy and love to eat. Um, so we're a baby industry at the end of the day, right? Um, you know, no company has 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 commercialized yet in the United States today. You can only buy cultivated meat. In, in Singapore, soon to be Israel, uh, the United States is, you know, the federal government has, has signaled to us that they are interested in, in, in um, ultimately allowing cultivated meat products to enter the market in the United States, but we are a baby industry. And, you know, that's a, that's a good thing, right? If you're an entrepreneur, that's, that's the right time to jump into an industry like this, because effectively, you know, if the question is what career paths exist, uh, all paths are available, you know, in front of you when you're when you're part of a you know an industry that's that's pushing the envelope like like what we're doing, right? So you know, on any given day, entry level positions, we're looking for lab assistants, we're looking for lab techs, um, but you know, entrepreneurs come in all shapes and sizes, and and at the end of the day, if you're willing to show up and you're willing to figure out, hey, what needs to be done, what work is available to be done, I'm I'm happy to do it. Um, that's that's a little bit of everything. That's business development. It's it's product development, it's bioprocess manufacturing, it's it's marketing, it's HR, it's a little bit of everything. Um, we're growing very quickly, our industry is growing very quickly. And what that means is somebody that's interested in this work, there are plenty of opportunities for you to grow yourself professionally and to grow your career. That's, that's great, that's a really interesting summary because we've been talking with the students um, that are in the uh, a bioflex pre-apprenticeship about the fact that you can be interested in business you can be interested in real estate you can be interested in marketing you can be a, in science and math whatever and still have a career in the los angeles county area in something that's in the life sciences so it's really great that you brought that up thank you okay so let's move on um Career pathway, now we're talking personal, we're getting personal now. So we'd like each of our panelists uh, to share your personal career pathway. Some of it's already been discussed, um, but your education background, if it has not been discussed, the role of finding a mentor, if you found that important, and organizations or other networking that helped you along the way and that you would recommend to our students uh, as they're moving through their uh, career exploration. I mean, they're, they're, you know, we have a lot of young people on this call and some of them think they know what they want, some of them don't. And that's, that's uh, why we want to give them some of this advice. So switching order a little bit, um, Latira, Dr. Haynes, would you start with your background? Because yours is interesting too, kind of like uh, Sean and how you morphed. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was one of those kids who thought like, for instance, they were like a little kid, they wanted to be like a medical doctor. And then I got into um, a program, a summer program, my eighth grade year, um, where I went to Temple University and I like was able to shadow doctors, but then we were also able to do laboratory research. And I fell in love with laboratory research. I loved just the, the exploration, the asking of the questions, doing the experiments, like the analyzing and then planning. I just loved the entire process of it. And so 
Um, I continue to do summer research um, almost every summer, um, all throughout um, college. And, um, and in college, I started doing um, bigger internships as well. Um, and like, like worked for Merck, the pharmaceutical company, and did an internship at the National Institutes of Health and such. And so I would recommend, um, if you are interested, definitely look into as many internships as possible and quite a few of them pay you and house you. Um, but yeah, so after that, like in, in college, I decided that I really just wanted to be, to get my doctorate, just to get my PhD in biomedical sciences. I was really interested in the immune system. I love the immune system. I actually had a colleague um, who went to go work at Kite when she was, um, did her, when she did her second postdoc. Um, but I decided to go to UC San Diego for my PhD. And while I was there, one of the requirements often is to teach a college course or to be an assistant um, t um, TA for a college course. But I really didn't want to teach college students. Um, I really always loved tutoring and teaching. I'm a first generation college student. Um, uh, um, and um, I was just used to like breaking down science so my family could understand. So um, I decided to join this program at the university where instead of teaching college students, we could partner with a high school teacher for a year and translate our research. Um, and it was really about learning how to make um, scientific research accessible to the general public, that if you could explain it to a high school student, you could explain it to anyone. And I loved that experience. I really, really enjoyed um, teaching the students. And like I was, while I was getting my doctorate, I was the only, um, I was the only um, black woman getting my doctorate um, and, or just working as a scientific researcher and my, um, uh, Institute and my friend who was a Colombian woman was the only Hispanic woman working to get um, their PhD um, as well. And so we just really kind of felt that that void um, of diversity. And I just became really passionate that's like reflecting on my life and that like neither of my parents went to college and I was here getting my PhD. And it was really mainly because I had a lot of teachers who pushed me and who really um, found those internships for me and told my mom and my dad of like what um, different programs I should be in. So I really want to find more students like myself um, who can go on to do amazing things in science and engineering um, because those doors have been open for them and they've been exposed and they realize like, oh, this is a thing that I can do. And I've seen that. Um, I've been teaching for eight years. I told myself I would teach at least 10 years. And I've had students um, go on to um, college. They, a lot of them are going and are getting their um, science degrees. And I have a, a few graduating this year um, um, from college. And so I'm super excited for, yeah, for them and what they'll bring to the area of science. Yep. That's that's fabulous. Yeah, I think the whole idea of role modeling is so important. And that's why we do these these programs, this expanding career, because we want to provide role models. And um, just so that everybody who's on the call knows, if you don't know this, um, the four speakers now and uh, and then the ones we've had in the past have all been, are all open to letting you contact them either through LinkedIn or uh, another way and we will be Donovan will send that out at the after the meeting with what they've said that they they're happy to talk with you if you you know want to do something more personal one one on one so let's move on um, the same question for you Quinn um, I don't know if you remember the question at this point, but it was your career pathway um, and, you know, some of the things because you've had an interesting life and changing. So please help us along your path. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, well, Dr. Haynes, thank you so much for sharing your journey. Um, I am a first generation college student as well. Um, I came from a low income family um, and first generation Vietnamese American. So at the time when I was going to school, I really had no means to figure out how do I do this and where do I go? Um, so it was a lot of self-learning, um, which is why I'm really happy to be here today because any of the things that I learned, I'm really happy to be able to knowledge share with you. Um, I ended up actually getting my um, bachelor's of science in chemistry from Berkeley, um, didn't know what to do with it. 
So I went into industry and I did research for a few years for Johnson and Johnson. And during that time, I knew I did not want to be in the labs long term. Um, but there was this inherent passion to do the work that would ultimately save patient lives. So I took a really hard left turn and actually actively pursued a career in talent acquisition within life sciences. Um, so in that time, I um, the last 20 years have actually been focused within talent discovery, talent attraction with biotech companies. Um, in the last five years, have actually been concentrated in uh, oncology. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you. Um, when I graduated from school, it was shortly after 9-11, so there weren't a lot of career opportunities. And one of the avenues that I found really beneficial for me to explore what was the right path was actually um, temp agencies. And there were a number of scientific staffing companies that were um, sharing positions with me. It gave me a really good sense of what companies do, what career paths I could potentially consider. Um, it was a free resource for me to help with my resume review, interview coaching. Um, and I got to work in an environmental lab. I got to work in research. Um, and in, in that networking, that organic networking, I um, was able to identify um, my mentor, who was the head of chemical engineering at J&J. &J. Um, and in those conversations about my personal growth and development, that's where I started to actively pursue a career um, focused on the people that, that, that um, find the cures. So um, a little bit of a different path. Um, but I'm really happy to say that I still get to work with people who are literally holding in their hands what could be the cure to someone's cancer, just doing it very, very behind the scenes. Thank you. Thank you. And in your in your current job, because uh, this was a question that came up and it kind of relates to what you've been telling us, um, what does talent acquisition do? Um, essentially, what we do is we identify people for our business. So when um, it's not just the, our hiring manager has an open job, we go find somebody, uh, we're doing really intentional and creating sustainable, impactful programs for talent discovery. Um, and that could actually start at the elementary school level, um, helping to foster a lot of long-term mentorships where we essentially find the next generation of leaders and scientists. So part of that is being able to um, understand what somebody's um, career goals are, um, what skills they bring, and that includes technical and otherwise, um, what they want to learn and how they want to apply um, their foundational skills. And we help to identify positions that could potentially align with what their goals are. Thank you. That was a question from Brianna from Animal Leadership Charter High School, just so you know. Okay, um, let's go on to uh, Sean. Uh, you've given us some of your career pathway, quite a bit of it. So maybe we can focus with you on the concept of mentors and networks. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Networks and, and mentors have been really critical in, in my success. As you can see, I've had many different careers, starting with academic neurosurgery to entrepreneurship and now venture capital. Um, and also, you may follow me on TikTok, um, where I'm a STEM creator as well, um, trying to inspire the next generation. Uh, so, and everything I've done has been an evolution of this, you know, this North Star I have of of meaningfully impacting and improving medicine and, and, and saving lives. Um, and every and each one of those can do that. So um, my earliest mentor came in undergraduate. Grant, uh, granted, I, I went to, to University of Seattle in the 90s and email just came out. But but here's here's something for you all. Like cold, cold DMs, cold emails work. That's how I found my mentor. And uh, we're We've been friends for almost 25 years now, actually 27 years now. Um, he's been amazing in my life. Um, you know, you may you may understand that I've never seen someone that looks like me in neurosurgery, in biotech, or venture capital. Like I've 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 met maybe one or two people in each of those fields um, over the past 20 years. But when I started out, there was no one that looked like me. And so um, my first mentor was Sean Grady. Um, 
a great man. Um, he's a professor of neurosurgery at, at the University of Washington. And it was just a cold email. I emailed, you know, all, all seven of the academic neurosurgeons. He, he was the only one that reached back out. Um, and he uh, had me volunteer in the lab for a couple months. And I did well enough that he hired me on. Um, and that started our 27-year relationship that uh, he helped uh, helped me decide to do an MD-PhD versus just an MD because I fell in love with the research um, as well. And uh, so he basically introduced me to the entire department. The chairman also became my, my mentor, um, and that, that just flourished. Beyond that, I went to his alma mater for neurosurgery, which was UVA, University of Virginia. That's where I did my PhD in my medical school. Um, and then his mentors became my mentor. Um, and then it just, get, it just kept going from there. And, you know, after my MD, PhD, I was so juiced about uh, research and advancing neurosurgery that I decided to hold off on training in neurosurgery. And I went to Oxford, University of Oxford in England and did an extra three-year postdoc, um, which is uh, unusual. Um, and I got that position because of him and him writing letters. Um, and this is my Oxford College, Brazenos. Um, I was only supposed to be there for a year, but it was, it was so awesome. I stayed for three. Um, so, and, and today he sits on our scientific advisory board at my company. Um, you know, uh, we, we still stay, stay in touch and he's, he's really changed my life. Um, and, uh, so find, find your Sean Grady, uh, he's out there uh, there's, and there are several other people along the way who helped, um, you know, when I first started my company, I had no experience, um, in entrepreneurship directly, particularly in biotech, um, I was floored when, you know, I, I raised my first money from friends and family and, and I was hoping to get about $50,000 to get off the ground. And of course, this is 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, I was able to raise about 150 um, through just people I knew. I did help that I went to medical school and some of my friends were now doctors. Um, but then, uh, so, you know, it's kind of funny because we raised $20 million for that company. Ultimately, um, our I raised $20 million and subsequently they've raised more, but that most of that 20 million, again, came through the network. My, something I didn't know, my co-founder, who was uh, the professor of radiation oncology at UCSF, she had, she had a rich uncle. Uh, so it's kind of a rich uncle story. And, um, and he just wanted to support us. And so he introduced us to some of his other rich friends and they literally funded the first 15 million to the company Man, um, nice. uh, with, within four months. And so network, um, and today you can do it on LinkedIn online. Um, it's so much easier today. So get out there. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And you are very active that we know. Okay, Pavle, um, a little bit about your background, which is a little bit different than everybody else's. So we'd like to hear about yours, as well as, um, you know, anything you'd like to discuss with your pathway to where you got to now, and the whole idea of mentorship and any organizations. Yeah, definitely. Uh, first of all, Sean, I mean, the power of just, you know, cold emails and reaching out to people out of the blue, it costs you absolutely nothing to do, right? There's very little downside. The worst thing you can get is a no. The best thing you can get is an incredible career and a path that you didn't even expect in life. So um, I, I think that's, you know, probably above all else, one of the main takeaways for everybody today is, you know, don't be shy about reaching out to somebody. You never know what that might turn into. The downside is, is minimal to non-existent. It costs you nothing. So a little bit about myself. Thanks everybody else for, for sharing their stories. Very incredible. Um, love love hearing all the all the different stories and, and everyone's backgrounds. Um, my family and I are actually uh, refugees from from former Yugoslavia. So so we came to America with with nothing, with with very little. Um, and and my parents instilled an entrepreneurial spirit in me very early, whether they intended to or not. It was a lot of just hey, you just kind of have to figure it out. There's no rule book. There's no plan. We just kind of have to figure it out and, and make it work and, and find our own success. And, and you know, I, I brought that to, to my career very early. Um, you know, I, I graduated uh, from college, you know, right when the economy took a massive nosedive and, and I had no idea what I was going to do with myself. Um, I, I met a few individuals who, who started a, a music streaming company um, and uh, they basically, the pitch was, hey, we can't pay you anything, but you can be here if you want and uh, you can be a sales associate and, and figure out how to pay yourself by, by closing some deals. I said yes, um, and uh, that turned into an incredible opportunity to me that that 
that set me down a path to that I'm that I'm on today. Um, that company grew very quickly. Ultimately, uh, we were sued by all the major record labels for fifteen and a half billion dollars. Um, yes, with a B, um, and uh, and and ultimately that that didn't work out. But um, sometimes those are those are the best ways to learn. Um, you know, met a few other individuals and uh, uh, reached out to a few folks that were looking to expand a business uh, in in San Francisco. Um, I said yes to that opportunity. I had never been to San Francisco before. I moved to San Francisco sight unseen um, and, and kind of start, you know, continued my, my career from there. Ultimately, that company was, was sold to WeWork um, and, you know, really just kind of built my career by, by just saying yes to opportunities and to yes to whatever work was coming my way. It, it kind of ultimately coalesced around, around uh, you know, HR, people, talent acquisition, uh, org development, org design, things like that. But, but really, you know, it was, it was a career of, of, of a little bit of everything, you know, Swiss Army knife when you're, when you're in a startup environment, that, that tends to be the case. Um, the, the kind of a cheap crowning achievement for myself so far up to this point was uh, I, I had joined a, a, uh, a uh, journalism uh, company called called The Athletic. It's a sports media company. Um, grew that company from uh, about 80 employees to roughly 700 globally. And ultimately, we, we sold that company to, to the New York Times. Um, when I met the folks folks at OMI, um, similar situation. You know, this is an area that I'm particularly passionate in. Um, you know, they were looking for somebody to, to help to join the team to help them scale the company. Um, so I said, yes, I said, this is exactly something I want to be doing. I want to align my passions with what I do professionally. And, and here I am. Um, <clears throat> on the topic of, of mentors, I think it's, you know, everybody kind of said, said a lot of the important points. I want to maybe introduce a little hot take, potentially a controversial take on, on mentorship. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the movie Whiplash, but, um, you know, yes, there's a lot of great mentors out there that are good people that you should definitely associate yourself with. But remember, a mentor can also be somebody that maybe you don't like, or maybe you don't agree with, or somebody that's, that's not, you know, a positive experience in your life. Some of the some of the best lessons that I've learned in my career are from people that I, nece I didn't necessarily get along with. And they teach you, you know, the type of person that you don't want to be or how you want to change certain behaviors that they have. And, you know, when you get an opportunity to lead, uh, you want to do things differently. So just something to think about, something to keep an eye on. Sometimes the negative experiences that you have in your career uh, can lead to some of the, the most, you know, gains and, and, the, and the best learning that, that you'll have. Um, so something to keep in mind as you think about mentorship and, and as you navigate your careers. Interesting advice. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to call you the just say yes person on our, on our panel. I mean, music, sports, journalism. <laughs> it's like, wow. Yeah. So yes, folks, you can do a lot of twisting and turning in your career pathway. Uh, thank you so much. Before we get to my favorite question, um, which is just so that everybody can anticipate, um, give us one piece of advice that you wish you had been given early in, early in your career that you'd like to share with this group. I'm going to go to the questions from our audience. So uh, we have a, quite a number of faculty from uh, mostly from community colleges, some from uh, public school, and they are asking the advice for high school and community college teachers to give to their students. So what piece of advice would you give? And this is kind of an open question. So just unmic yourself and uh, pipe in. Who'd like to start? Pavle, did you want to start? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know we 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 touched on this point already, but um, you know, don't be shy about about reaching out and, and trying to build your network. Right? There's no such thing as, especially in a world of LinkedIn and social media. Right? You know, don't overthink the approachability of another person, regardless of their seniority level. I think you know there, there's no harm in reaching out and saying, "Hey, look, I'm interested." you know, put me in touch with the right person that I need to talk to. Or if there's a particular company or organization that you're looking to join, look up what who's on the talent acquisition team at that company, who's in HR, you know, or, or who's the manager of a particular department that, that you think might be interesting to you. Reach out to that person, reach out to a few people, right? The worst thing that can happen is you get a no or you get no response at all. The best thing that can happen is it might turn into a career opportunity for you. So I think, you know, 
just moving past that initial shyness or that initial, you know, should I do this? I don't want to bother other people. Forget all that. You have to put yourself out there. It's the only way you're going to get those opportunities um, that you're looking for. Thank you. Um, would anybody else like to pipe in on that one? What you think teachers should be uh, telling their students? Thank you, uh, Quinn. Yeah. So there's um, a number of nonprofit organizations and groups that you can join um, at all levels, including junior high and above, um, that are identity based. So I think of SWE, so Society of Women Engineers, AWIS, Association of Women in Science, SACNA, Society um, uh, uh, for Advancement for uh, Chicanos and Native Americans in STEM, uh, NISB, Nobache. And I mentioned that because there are um, conferences you can attend, these type of events, networking events, seminars, fireside chats that give you um, the opportunity to hear different perspectives, different experiences, and different voices. So you can join these groups um, online um, as educators. This should be, um, there are opportunities to actually enroll your students as members, I think, at, um, for free or significantly reduced. Um, and these memberships do provide um, a lot of access. So that would be another um, piece of advice I would share. And um, the panel the panel group here has talked a lot about LinkedIn. And I, I have to say it is kind of like the go-to platform. So if you don't have a LinkedIn, super easy to, to start one up. Um, and it's it's free. The thing is just remember that it's kind of one of those platforms where people like me in HR and talent acquisition, where we're looking at the content here, um, but you are, it's easy to join groups online. All of those organizations that I mentioned to you have LinkedIn um, uh, company pages. You can join there. You can get um, notifications on their events as well. Yeah, and thank you. And actually one of the programs in the Bioplex pre-apprenticeship is to get onto LinkedIn. So thank you for that little push. We appreciate it. Okay, um, Al, uh, one of our participants today uh, in the audience is Alexandra Panetta. And Alexandra, you asked a qu your question was, what is your daily routine in terms of work? Alexandra, is there anybody in particular that you would like to answer that question? If you could just unmute yourself. Are you there? I know you're in the audience because I found your name. Um, no, it, it just is for anybody. For anybody. Okay. So who would like to kind of give a picture of a daily routine? Maybe um, maybe Latera and maybe one of our entrepreneurs. What do you think? Latera, can you start? I think daily routine yeah. as like for me right now as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Oh my Lord. Um, <laughs> it's a long day. <laughs> I will let you know that that teaching is is a takes a lot more out of me than than academic research did. Just being in a lab is very different. Um, but yes, um day in the life, I'm a I'm more of a person who thinks um very well in the morning. So I wake up early and do all of my workouts and such then because um oftentimes I'm staying after school. Like right now, I'm still at school doing this Zoom. Um, and helping out um, students and such, but like um, a lot of days are spent planning. Um, because I'm a biotechnology teacher, we do do um, really advanced um, labs. And so um, I'm at a new school, but in my old uh, old school, I had a yeah very nice lab. And so I would I'm like planning out experiments, getting reagents together, um, really trying to figure out how I'm going to challenge my students and help them build those skills that if they were to go to someone's lab, whether it be industry or at a um, university, that they would be able to participate in the research and have those skills already. So I spend a lot of time planning and then, of course, all the teaching and then the grading and also then preparing them for um, competitions and such um, as well, like after school. And yeah, so it's it's a lot every day, but it's really fun. I really enjoy my students. I love to see them see them grow. But um. Yeah, very different than when I was getting um, when I'm working as a researcher because that was a more it's a more fluid schedule then. But like teaching is very it's a much more rigorous and rigid schedule. But I do have um, 
quote unquote breaks, but usually I'm working then too. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Would um, one of the other panelists like to add on that? What, what does your typical day look like? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll chime in here. Maybe I'll do like a, a full day here um, to the best of my ability. So uh, I, I'm that super annoying mor morning person. I like to wake up really, really early. Um, I, I wake up at four uh, and I start start my day then. First few hours of the day are mine and mine alone. That's when I work out. That's when I journal. Uh, that's when I focus on on myself. Uh, you know, I think you know focusing on on your body and your mind just pays dividends in, in every other part of your day and every other part of your life. You'll be happier. You'll be more present. You'll show up more for for your family and, and for the work that you're doing. So starting the day with myself. Um, you know, typically in terms of a work day, I mean, no two days are the same when you're an entrepreneur, but I think a few kind of tips uh, to, to help you kind of turn chaos into order. Um, typically, I'll start my day by checking my emails, then it'll be a flurry of meetings. And before I know it, it'll be it'll be the afternoon, at which point I'll, I'll check my emails again. So the point there is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm time boxing specific things for specific parts of the day. Um, you know, I'm not checking my emails periodically throughout the entire day. Um, after a day, um, that's typically, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll intentionally, uh, you know, make sure that I'm off my electronics at a certain time, uh, usually right around dinner time. Dinner time is, is for family and it's for being present. So no work, no things like that during dinner. I like to go to bed nice and early. Nothing productive happens after 9 p.m. as far as I'm concerned. Go to bed, start the whole thing up again the next day. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can't say that I can quite go along with that one, but many do. Okay, I'm going to change the question so that we get to a few more of these. Um, this is, I think, a, another really good question. It came from another from Anna Lopez, also at the Animo Leadership, and she's asking what resources are best for finding internships or research opportunities. Who would like to answer that one? Um, I'll hop in real quick. Um, okay, sure. Let's we'll get to plug Quinn. to. Awesome. Yeah, I'd love to give uh, some props to our local uh, Bioscience LA, and they have the Biofutures program. Uh, college students, local college students, can get an internship for and get paid for that, and it doesn't cost um, the company anything. They pay for it. Uh, Bioscience LA does through uh, funding from the government, uh, local government, and so that's one plug. Um, at least in the LA area, if for community college students and and beyond. Uh, beyond that. Like I said before, the internet is a vast and wonderful place. Um, lots of opportunities there, uh, many different companies. Um, it's 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 as easy as as just googling or uh, maybe even chat GPTing. But if you're interested in startups in particular, uh, one resource is Y Combinator, and they have uh, a site called startupjobs.com, um, I believe, uh, or no, it's work at a startup.com. And those are all the jobs that at their uh, portfolio companies, all the startups that went through Y Combinator, which is the largest and most famous um, uh, startup accelerator. So those are some resources, but the internet uh, is stock full of these opportunities. Okay, great. And Quinn, do you want to pop in there? Yeah. Um, on the theme of networking, um, continue to network with your teachers, your professors, your educators, your career counselors at your schools. Um, a lot of companies will use the platform um, handshake.com, where that's actually specifically geared towards internships at all levels, so you can easily sign up there. Um, and what you'll notice, I would suggest that as you start to see internships and apply to it, take that extra step of double clicking into the company's landing page and adding yourself to their talent network. Because sometimes not every position is posted, so at least you're getting a chance to campaign your qualifications and your background and your enter uh, your uh, resume or your CV, your profile um, is parsed into their company. Thank you. Um, any other comments on that one on internships? I know it's a hot topic. Anybody else? No. Okay. All right. Moving on. Um, I'm going to kind of duel this one, and this is from Amanda um, at Fullerton College, and it's what makes a resume, and I'm going to add what makes a student stand out for an interview. What makes a resume stand out? What makes a student stand out for an interview? So where would you like to start? We got two people people here, two talent <laughs> people. Why don't we start with, uh, uh, Pavla, you want to start? 
Sure, sure, Quinn, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. I think like, look, like there's, you know, the, I'm going to approach the, the resume question from like how to hack your resume kind of perspective. I think, you know, the reality is, is, you know, when you're submitting your resume, especially if it's part of a large organization, right, what, what the so software is really looking for is specific keywords and things like that. So what I typically recommend to people is, you know, come up with a, a master version of your resume and then adapt your resume according to, to the jobs that you're applying for, right? Um, you know, you want to use language that's similar to the language that's being used in the job description, language that's similar to what they're using on the website, right? You're trying to effectively make your resume stand out to a machine before a before a person will see it right other things to think about in your resume is to put what's most relevant top third of, of the resume right when a human being is looking at your resume they're not going to spend a lot of time looking at it especially if they're looking over hundreds of resumes for any particular job so you want that top third to, to stand out keywords again that are relevant to to the job uh, should be near the top uh, your most relevant experience should should be near the top um, if you're applying for a position that you know is going to be competitive, the best way to stand out is to, again, try and find out who's on the team, who's on the talent acquisition team, reach out to those individuals, make it known to them that you are interested in this opportunity, what you specifically ap uh, applied for. It increases your chances of being seen, of being visible. Um, sometimes just reaching out to that person may, may you know, be enough for, for that recruiter to say, cool, let me just take a look at that individual in the system. Oh yeah, you know, they are qualified for, for this position. I'll, I'll, I'll bring them in for a phone screen. So, you know, it is a bit of a numbers game, but you're trying to maximize your chances of, of being seen by, by these organizations. Thank you, thank you. Quinn, you wanna to add to that? Yeah, my advice would be whenever you're ready to write your resume, think about what differentiates you from any of your colleagues, any of your um, peers that are applying, that could potentially be applying to the same job. And to me, that's about quantifying your accomplishments. Um, now, one thing I do want to make sure that we focus on is you will probably likely be applying for entry level positions. So you might see a lot of lab skills and the job description that you think, I don't have that, and that's okay. You have 50%, 40%, you've learned that um, from school, still apply because a lot of the lab work is we can teach it, and technology is advancing so quickly that you're going to have to learn it again no matter what. Um, but what's really important that I find value in is when I get to understand your core work ethics, your time management, without you needing to tell me. So if you're going to school full time and you also work at Starbucks full time, I want to know that. It tells me you can handle working in a high pressure environment. You have customer service skills. Um, those are the things that I really value. So when you think about your resume, um, to Pablo's point, kind of focus on that technical core competencies in the beginning. Um, think about your education secondary to that. And then you can separate either your work experience or lab experience. And work experience could, again, encompass something that maybe not be related to industry, but it does convey um, the behaviors or soft skills that I think a lot of um, managers really value. That's the stuff that's hard to teach. Can I just add one more thing to, sure. to you, you made a really good point that I want to expand on. Don't, don't be shy about applying for, for opportunities that are maybe a little bit beyond what, what you're capable of, what you've done today. You know, maybe you don't fully meet the job requirements. Don't be afraid to stretch a little bit. I think one mistake that a lot of people make, especially early in their career, is they self-select themselves out of an opportunity. You know, you're going to get pl plenty of no's from recruiters. Don't, don't say no to yourself. Don't select yourself out of an opportunity. So even if you feel like you're not qualified, again, it costs you just a little bit of time to go ahead and apply. The worst thing that happens is a no or no response. So don't be afraid to stretch a little bit out of what you think your experience is for an opportunity. Go ahead and apply anyway. Thank you. 100% agree with that. And just one piece, don't feel you need to submit a cover letter. You don't. Okay. Unless specifically asked, correct? I will. I'll just say in the 20 years I've been doing this, I've never asked for a cover letter. There so you I, go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I almost never read them, so don't bother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you very much. I know that we, um, in our program, in our track one of the BioFlex, we do go over a lot of this, and I'm so glad that you're saying exactly what we tell them and more. So thank you. And if uh, those of you, if you didn't notice, um, Quinn has put the acronyms, the what I call the alphabet soup of organizations that she mentioned in the chat. So feel free to write those down. There are actually new ones for me in there. I thought I knew most of them. Thank you. That's great. Um, one last question, and you, we've kind of touched on this, but uh, Jim DeClo from Solano College, who's very involved in a lot of organizations um, dealing with these middle skills, has asked um, if you can give any kind of a projection of opportunities in your field for the kind of the next five to, you know, maybe five years uh, when these students are going to be, you know, really considering jobs and going through college and so on. What do you see as the biggest growth areas that they might, opportunities that they should be looking at? And I'm gonna kind of go around the table here. So Sean, why don't you start? Um, yeah, sure, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, uh, I think it's the golden age of biotechnology and just, you know, when I started my company 10 years ago, you know, meat and agriculture and all this stuff was not really a thing. Um, although actually, uh, one of the one of the companies that started with me is now a multi billion dollar company uh, wow. that deals with Monsanto and such in agriculture, um, Pivot Bio. But um, but yeah, so you know it's only going to get better. Uh, the technology is going to be crazy, especially with AI. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that um, changes things. Um, but um, but yeah, so there will always be a need for for scientists and people interested in science at all levels because. Uh, um, like I said, the technology will continue to to advance, um, and uh, more money is going to come in. Obviously, the the macro uh, economic environment right now is poor, um, but um, people are still investing in in biotechnologies and AI. Um, it, it's going to be exciting to see what happens next. For me, I only focus on health related um, technologies, so a lot of a lot of that stuff is sort of stuck in the Stone Ages, but um, uh, with 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 a re regulatory path and such. But um, Massive opportunity, massive opportunity. Great, thank you. Pavel, do you wanna add anything on there? Well, I would just say, you know, the, the fact that it's it's difficult for any one of us to kind of see where these technologies are gonna be truly 12 to 18 months from now is the opportunity, right? It, it just means that things are going to move and evolve so quickly. You know, we're, 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 we're on the cusp of, of multiple paradigm shifts, right? Certainly in the biosciences, definitely with AI, um, things like that, you know, in, in, in food, food agriculture and, and, and you know, protein and meat production alone, you know, we're, we're, in, we're trying to disrupt a $1.4 trillion global industry that, that frankly can't scale, you know, growing an animal takes time, slaughtering an animal takes time, right? To scale beyond that, you need to tr truly shift the entire paradigm and come up with something new and when that happens, it's very difficult to see what the new jobs are going to look like beyond that. But I always see that as an opportunity. It means that what's around the corner is going to be something that we haven't seen before. And the people that capitalize on those opportunities today are the ones that are going to be able to ride that wave and, and take on new roles and new opportunities that we can't even fathom today. Mm, interesting. Uh, Latera, what are you telling your students? What's the big opportunities? So one of the things I tell my students a lot um, is that um, the marriage of like science and engineering is really, really big. And I think um, in high school right now, a lot of high schools aren't privileged to have like any type of like engineering course um, to mix in with the science. And so I do um, tell my students that engineering like is really just the problem solving while like the the science is like about answering the questions. And if you have both of those skills, you will be like you'll be able to do just whatever happens in any industry if you're interested in science, whether it be bioscience or like chemical and chemical engineering and such, but like and even anything with technology as well. And so that's one of the things I tell my students often is to really look into and try to find ways to um, grow in engineering just so that you have that type of like mindset and the thought processes that go with engineering because it makes you very, very versatile so for whatever is coming down this pipeline that we don't understand or know. Thank you. Thank you. And Quinn, let's uh, polish off from with you. Um, what do you see as the big opportunities? Perhaps maybe stick to biomanufacturing. Yeah, sure. So 
I think there's just some evergreen skills that um, regardless of how the industry advances, um, GMP, GDP, aseptic technique, um, if you have an opportunity, especially for the world of cell therapy, learning get full gowning, being in a full bunny suit, what that entails. Um, but the core of it is having the capability to um, work in a regulated environment. So that's where the GMP and GDP concepts um, will really, you want to leverage. Um, in general, I also see this trend, and perhaps the other panelists can share too, a lot of companies are really now understanding the power of data. So we're seeing um, lots of focus in data analytics. So if you have an opportunity to learn R or Python, that's pretty big at industry, um, as well as predictive modeling. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned those because I see, I see a lot of that online. So thank you for mentioning that. Okay, so now uh, a one minute uh, final question for each one of you. Uh, the one piece of advice that you wish you had been given that you would like to share with this audience, who would like to start? I'll start. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the one piece of advice I could have given, I wish I could have given myself was uh, it's okay, no pressure. All of this <laughs> stuff will figure itself out. I don't need to have a certain title or make a certain salary by a certain age. Um, and what's more important is being able to align with a company ethos or my personal passions for the work I want to do to make medicine. Um, and it might look different than what I initially carved out. And maybe it took a couple of years, but it'll all settle in. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who would like to go next? Um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be fast. I'll, I'll just say this. My, my most like, you know, stomach dropping cringiest failures in my career are now I look back on as some of the, the best, you know, moments of, 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 of my career. It's when I learn the most. Um, it's when you reflect the most. Um, you are going to fail. Don't be afraid about failure. Failure is, the, is a great teacher. It's one of the best ways you can grow. So don't shy away from it. If and when it happens, use it as an opportunity to reflect, you know, look, look directly at it, lean into it and use it as an opportunity to learn because that is when you learn the most. So don't be afraid of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lachera, what would you say? Advice that you wish yeah. you had gotten. Mm -hmm. I wish um, someone would, tell, uh, would have told me to like make sure that in every season that I'm like enjoying what I'm doing. I know sometimes we like get the advice to just like you put your head in the sand and you just have to like tough out these next three or four years and then life will start. And that's just not a way to live life. Um, like, yes, you have to work hard, but you need to make sure you are finding um, enjoyment like in something in some type of hobbies or something like that. Because life is not about getting to a destination. It's really about just enjoying what you are doing in that moment. Even if you do have like little, um, like little like points along the way, it's just like, like, like video games. It's just like, you know, there's levels, but you enjoy each level um, as you are moving. And so that's what I would um, tell myself. And I tell my students as well. Fabulous. Sean. Sure, I, I, um, I'm borrowing this one from uh, one of my favorite uh, creators, Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V. Uh, but he says, um, changing your mind is a strength. Um, as you've seen, we've all had sort of a winding path, uh, pathway in our careers. And maybe part of the reason why I, I didn't stop uh, training until grade 31 was I was afraid of the judgment, I was, I was afraid of the change, I was afraid of taking that risk, that leap. Um, and what I should have, uh, not judged myself um, first. Um, and so, but when I finally did make that decision, you know, I haven't been able to stop being so fluid since, you know, I, I again, I had the North Star and as long as what I was doing um, made me happy and I enjoyed it and was towards that North Star, that's all that mattered. So again, from neurosurgery, which I loved to the research, which I love to starting a company after I made a discovery, which I love, and then trying to help other people start companies of their own. You know, changing your mind is strength. And a lot of people tie their identity to their career, which is dangerous because if you ever lose that career or like me, decide not to be a neurosurgeon anymore, you feel like you don't, you're not important. You, you feel like you have no value in the world anymore. Um, and, and that's, that's a danger. And so um, it's not, that's not the reality. I mean, so again, uh, you know, be kind to yourself. Don't judge yourself. Changing your mind is a strength and we all do it. 
That's fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, it brings me back to what a famous surfer uh, actually said, and you're all saying it, do what you love and you'll love what you do. It's as, very, it's as simple as that. And if we remember nothing else, I think that what you all say on that last question, which is why we leave it for last, is so important. Um, so I just want to thank you. This has been fabulous. I just, I, you know, I got goosebumps in some of this. So I really thank you. I think the, the folks are participating, hopefully you got a lot out of this program. Um, we are just going to ask the those that are in our cohort and the Washington prep and the animal prep to stay on. Um, and the and the rest of you again, thank you very, very much. And we'll be following up with some uh, remarks out by email. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for the time. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks.